So today um, we have um, uh, Nico Tricevich of ARF, that all of you here should know him, and Scott Barnum, the two of the four um, scholars who are working here. Um, Jose Capriles is also a co-director on my project. He gets around as Jose. And um, Helen Muro Santoro of uh, Arica, Chile. Um, so I guess all of their... Well, Tarapa College, I guess, is what their university is called. So many, many people involved, and they have been working now for some time on the uh, north coast of the Atacama Desert in northern Chilean area, and this should prove to be a good project. As you know, Nico uh, works here in the ARC. He's a <coughs> professional archaeologist, and this is just his most recent research that he's been involved in. He, they just got out of the field weeks ago, virtually, since so it's hot off the hot, dry uh, environment, and Scott Byron has been an affiliate, an associate, I don't know those names, uh, here with ARC for many years. He, he has his own consulting firm, though, and he, this equipment you see before you is kind of his baby, and his a company, if you wanted to look it up and what it's involved in, is called Feature Survey, so it's all about walking across the landscape and finding out what's underneath it, right? So the two of them, I guess, are team talking today and presenting this field research that is, well, you'll tell us the dates, but recently, very recently. So welcome, Scott, and thank you, Nico. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a uh, pleasure to talk about this exciting work we're doing with, um, with this Ch Chilean team in, in, in Atacama Desert. So, uh, first I'm going to um, introduce the, the work we've been doing, sort of the overview. Um, we've been, we kind of jumped in late on a long-running project, so we have the pleasure of like, having a lot of material to show you, so I'm just going to quickly breeze through. So first I'll introduce the landscape, I'm going to show you some of the artifacts that they've been finding in this area, and then I'll talk about the time of geometry and Scott will talk about the radar work that we're using participated or, or uh, conducted down in the Atacama. So, uh, as I mentioned, the, this project has been going on for some years. Alonso Santoro, in particular, a well-known Chilean archaeologist who was here in 2016 speaking about this very area, uh, has been working there for some decades now, and they've, they've located many terminal Pleistocene sites in this area that was previously thought of as, as inhabitable. Uh, and uh, so his project has recently got a grant through this organization, uh, this subgroup of the Chilean, um, it's the Technology and Science Institute of the Chilean Government, kind of like their ASF. And they have a Programa de Corporación Internacional. So they've been working with a number of foreigners, including us. Um, and that's what supported this work. Uh, other international. Scholars to work with them include uh, Paul Dietrich and Lawrence, and we're here today. And it's been great to be able to work with these scholars from um, who are real experts in these different domains that they're bringing to, their, to this work. Uh, and that also includes um, Claudio Santorre, who's an expert in interior ecology and, and um, reconstructions. So, this area has uh, one thing that's really exciting about it is that there's these through these sites, right, these um, parallel places and sites are right at the end of the early Holocene, but then there's very little impact in the area because this hyper-aridity of the Atacama Desert has led to near total abandonment until recent times. Um, there's a few windows when people were in there, but, but you have these very shallow but uh, old sites right on the surface. So these can help us to understand more about the people in South America and how this may have occurred. As we know, the, the, uh, the coastal route has been growing in popularity, and this, uh, and this is not exactly on the coast, but it's near the coast, and it perhaps helps us understand how people could have gotten as far as uh, Monteverde at 14,000 or even earlier now. Um, research is showing uh, years before present, and uh, it, uh, so what you see is a lot of coastal sites are becoming um, recognized, but none of them lie in the middle of the Everglades. 
They're not going to lie. They in the Atacama core here. Um, so this this area we're speaking about today, Quebrada Mani, is uh, right here. It's not on the coast, and it's not in the highlands. Um, it lies in this area that's known as the hyperarid core of the Atacama, and it's hyperarid because it has. Um, here's a well, zoom in on that area. It has a coastal range separating it from the Pacific Ocean, and it also has the, the Pre-Cordillera and the, the Andes here, the Western Cordillera and the Andes. And so you have these rich resources like the Pacific Ocean here, and the, the Humboldt Current sweeps up the Pacific coast here, so the fisheries are terrific. Uh, and then you have the, the, the Puna with the Macuna and the um, and other big game up here. But in the middle, it's, it's extremely arid today, but uh, research is showing that there, while it, was, it wasn't vegetated heavily on the, around these areas, there were oases that connected the, the, the coastal with the highland, and so it wasn't as, as un, unwelcoming as, as one thought. Um, so here's another view of this hyper-arid core and research that's occurred in has been focusing on this area that's known as the Campa de Tamarugal, which is this tree that can, this is phreatic vegetation that can survive and tap into the, the water that's down underneath, uh, that runs off of the, the Sierra here. Um, it's thought that the, this is extremely arid because you have these uh, coastal fogs that come up off the ocean, right, in some parts of the the Pacific, including California, right, the coastal marine layer, but that's blocked by this coastal cordillera. So it's a rain shadow from here, and it's especially a rain shadow coming from the predominant direction, which is from the Amazon. So it's a it's double, double dry. Um, but what you see is that there's evidence of previously vegetated areas. This, there's a lot of fossil wood that's found in some of these areas that are um, that are still present because of the aridity is preserving things very well. And uh, carbon dates that have been run on some of these vegetation shows that it's sort of episodic, that you have these periods of, of, of vegetative growth. And there was another one note here, which uh, is pretty recent. But the, the sites we're talking about today are right at the end of the Pleistocene, around 11 to 12,000 years, calendar years BP. So that's one source of information about the paleoecology comes from this vegetation that's present. Another major source is chinchilla rat babies, which is sort of the South American version of pack rat babies. And many of us are familiar with this type of work in the Great Basin, but uh, to summarize, basically these, these rodents go out and gather vegetative material from about 50 meters or less from their nests, and they build these nests, and if they're under a little roof, or somehow protected um, in this arid climate, the, they bring back this vegetative material, small rocks, animal dung, and they build these middens and they urinate on it and it preserves and it's called amber rat. It locks it in, it's like a time capsule. It can last up to 50,000 years. And the researchers like Claudio Latore crack them open and, and study the plant material like in, in these layers. And you can actually dig through to date those layers and, a pretty good sense of what was growing in, the, in that area. And the third source of information about the paleoecology is from lake cores that have been placed in the highlands in these um, lakes that are up on the Puna in Bolivia today. And these lake cores show that there was these paleo lakes, like Paleo Lake Cauca, and there, were, there, was a, there was a later period of pluvial events that occurred. And when these lake court, when these lakes were full, and then all this precipitation was occurring, especially in January, as you can see up here, that, that elevated the water table below. You actually had activated streams coming down into that dry icon, allowing those oases to flourish. Uh, so here you can see this this profile here is represented there in profile and that basically the water is accumulating in here. Nothing really grows much uh, below 2,300 meters. And then this pompa is at about 1,000 meters above sea level. 
And, uh, and what the archaeology is showing is that the second episode of, of the pluvial event is when most of the sites are uh, clustered around there. Um, so here's another view of the profile with, um, you see how the water basically goes underground, but then there's vegetation that takes advantage of that. So, um, we have, uh, they've found a number of sites, dozens of sites in this, in this area that, that date to that later pluvial event, which is known as the Central Indian Pluvial Event, or Cape, Cape 2, is that later one that dates from about 13,000 to 10,000 years ago. And um, I'm going to show you some material excavated here at Cape Rada Mani 12. You know, this, I put this map up here again so you can see it's, we're talking about Q1 of this kid right above me, so we're right in this area now. And we, uh, we have some, they, they did this work in about 10 years ago, and it was published in 2013, um, eight years ago, and published in 2013. And so I'll show you some artifacts from this site, but the project we're talking about today is primarily over here in QM35. The Pan American Highway is right here. And um, there's a lot of sites clustered in there, but all of these are dating to that Cape 2 pluvial event. So this is at QM12 off to the east. They found a, um, you see it's, it's relatively shallow, but they found a, a hearth, a prepared clay hearth, dated to 12.8 thousand BP, the state. And uh, it includes things like this vertical stone and a bird stick and some other stakes, animal bone, um, camelid bone. We find megafauna on the surface over at QM35, but, while, but all the animal bone that's been directly associated with human sites are camelid and, and no, no megafauna, no plasticine megafauna like the giant brown sloth. So there's a number of other material found in this site. Um, they have I'll just show you quickly some slides. These are, these are marine gastropods, and that's about 80, 85 kilometers to the west. So they're trading or, or traveling to the coast to bring back marine material. Uh, they have, this is the end of an apple. Um, some, other, some other material, everything preserves very nicely. That like camelid fiber thread, so they could have been spinning the, the, al al uh, the, the cuneum wall. This is before alpacas and Kemp and Yamas were domesticated. Um, and then some relatively large lithics, some early projectile point styles for the area. And more distinctive projectile point styles. So these are from the Ramaditas area. Those, those last ones are from up here. Some steady styles there. So now we're, uh, I'm going to turn to the site that we worked out most recently. In December, primarily. So here's a view of, of uh, Quebrada Mani 35. You have a, um, it, we're, we're now out in the, in the flats of the Atacama um, Pampa, and you can see that there's these kind of low ridges, and, and then this, this light area is today the lowest in the terrain, but it's not that much lower. You know, we're talking about a meter or so of relief, and maybe, maybe a little more, a meter and a half. And then here's a, one of the giant brown sloth that are just sitting on the surface. And we've got some photogrammetry of these. Um, unfortunately, no collagen is preserved in these bones, so they haven't been able to radiocarbonate or ancient DNA or any of those. But potentially, if someone's found in better uh, preservation, it could be study further. Another feature of this area is that this paleo wetland is there's a black mat, organic material that extends under the, these layers, and it's got some hot fruit off the black mat. So working at that with the radar. Another thing you see at the Cambrada Buddy 35 is, is tree stumps out in this area that doesn't look very welcoming to trees. These are cut because they, they they sampled from them, but uh, 
So these are the types of things we might be looking for or, or running into with, with geophysical methods. We might be uh, encountering density changes because of vegetation. We're taking some pictures of the of this young ground sloth. You can see these low rises. Most of the archaeological material is found on these low rises, these ridges. Then there's this concentration of rocks. Um, and I'm, I, I brought the magnetometer, the bar tinted radiometer, to on the trip with us, as well as one of the uh, our radars in Scotland that brought a, uh, another GSSI radar. And one of the motivations for bringing the magnetometer was the hopes that if these rocks contained enough ferrous material, they would stand out from the surrounding material and we would be able to identify very rock concentrations like this, perhaps on our cards. And we did not uh, have much luck with that, but I'll explain. So these are the types of projectile points found at Kibrana Mani 35. And these are definitely early styles in the in the region. And it'll just breeze over some of the maps of the okay, so here we see the plant of vegetation, some of the animal bone, artifacts on the surface. Um, they've put in about, uh, almost a dozen test units like this. They generally gave you two by twos because it's so sandy that it just collapses in. Um, you can see that this is getting down to sterile, but they're finding material in the top portions. But um, my understanding is they haven't found anything quite as intact as that QM12. They have uh, animal bone on the surface. Here's a heart, interpreted as a heart. And they got some nano states from that. They come out of the bones. Very shallow, though, so it's somewhat vulnerable. Um, we were trying to avoid stepping deeply into this, this desert pavement, this what they call two scarts, this salty material, um, but it's pretty soft in some areas, so we've got these overboots and blue foam, sort of like sand shoes, like snow shoes for sand. Uh -huh. and they, they helped. Um, but you can see, one reason I included this photo is you can see this low rise here. This is the ridge that we're talking about. That is um, where most of the archaeological materials found. Now, they hired right before we worked a Spanish woman with a drone came out. She's a geo geospatial specialist, and they got her to, to fly the area right before we worked, which was actually a great uh, you know, sort of coincidence that it happened like that, but it, it's very good because. We then showed up with our geophysical material. It had just been documented nicely, like lots of high resolution photographs before we acted with the geophysics. And, uh, and then she produced this DEM and photo scan from this Phantom 3 drone with a 4000K camera. And you can see that um, this is, I'm showing here the lithics. And the red are the diagnostic projectile points, the black triangles are non-diagnostic lithics, and the orange things are, are concentrations, but they're very much concentrated on that ridge. And you can see here on the, um, on the DEM that even though it's subtle, it's only a meter or so in relief, it, it really pops out. You want to talk about this for each other? Yes. Um, so the, the final materials you can see the breakdown here aren't so much concentrated on the ridge. There's a lot associated with the wetland, but again, they're not necessarily co occurring with the human occupation. Some of these, these could be much older, Pleistocene era. In fact, many of them are maybe the only example in American horse. And there's a horse here. Megatherium is right there, and the other Megatherium I showed you is here. And then there's also those stumps. Now the stumps do occur up here and around that black mat. That, that was over here. So here's the geophysical blocks that we were able to, to um, analyze in the period we were there, which was 
for the, well, we were in this site for three days, and we had another site for the for the day, well, two or two, three and a half days. And uh, the blue is my uh, magnetometry work, and Scott had his, um, the red blocks are radar, and, and then he did a number of transects with the radar that were just walking kind of long exploratory transects as well. So we were down there in early December, and um, I brought this magnetometer. This is a two-pole magnetometer radiometer. So there's a sensor, it's a fluxgate magnetometer that has a sensor on the top and the bottom of each pole. And the uh, idea there is that you can subtract the, the magnetic signal from the top pole from the bottom, from the signal from the bottom pole, basically eliminate the ambient magnetism and get focus on the differences. So if you pass over a high, highly magnetic feature, some ferrous material or some other you know, hot, uh, hard areas, and um, potential concentration of ferrous rocks, you could um, pick up the difference and you know, show up well and eliminate some of the, the environmental magnetic differences that you have when you walk. So there's two of them, which means you can walk, you can come across as much ground. So I walked, uh, the first day we covered, we did 30 by 30 meter blocks. We'd walk up, and then I'd walk back, and walk again. I wasn't able to do the zigzag, um, just because it, they weren't were meshing together well. But uh, this is, look at the DEM, you can see truck tracks here. This is a really high, this is from that corner. Okay. Um, so here's the, here's the magnetometry work in the 30 by 30 meter grid. And I'll fl flick back and forth. You can see that this, um, so I'll, I'll mention now that I've been speaking with Ronan's and Bill Dietrich a few weeks ago. They pointed out that there's um, pretty strong evidence that, that these are actually stream channels. Let me go back to the larger picture here. That this is actually an inverted stream channel. That is, when long ago, this was a, um, during that first pluvial event, perhaps, this area was scoured out and, and incised by these, by these uh, activated streams that were carving down from the Andes, and they would have carved out this channel that then heavier sediments were precipitated in this, in this channel, and then these were, this is basically denser than the surrounding area, right? So then, over the last, over the you know, millennia, this surrounding area was scoured by Eolian processes, that is the wind transport, blew a lot of the lighter material away, and what, what remains is this old stream channel. And today, it's a ridge, because it's more resistant than the stuff around it. So what, what we assumed was a, a ridge next to the paleo, you know, the paleo channels that are most evident, um, for geomorphologists, this looks like a, an ancient stream that has since been, uh, you know, is remnant and everything else was carried away. So, so we kind of had to invert our thinking, and this does look like a braided channel coming down. And and when I looked into the uh, when I look at the magnetometry data, I saw these sort of curving features, and I didn't know what to make of them. But when you look at the DEM behind it, they're in fact these curving. You know, Somewhat channel like features. Here's another, here's a block to the west, and we have, again, we have these sort of sinuous features, and, and then in the, in the magnetometry, we have some long. You know, uh, there are some, um, there are some anomalous looking uh, features in the magnetometry, and what you look for. In magnetometry data is often is a dipole, that is a strong positive and a strong negative. And, and a feature of interest would be right between the two, like that. That's what's causing a, a strong positive and negative. And this, uh, so we, we investigated the, some of these further with the radar, and that's what the red block is showing. There's another mag block to the west of that, and we went over these with the radar, and it wasn't um, particularly. We did see, so, we, uh, so we're, we're still in the process of interpreting those data. But so at this point, I guess I'll hand over to Scott, and he's going to talk about the, the radar work. Yeah. <coughs> uh, uh, 
We have both the uh, radar and the magnetometry operating out there. The magnetometry covers uh, so much more ground uh, because it doesn't need to make direct contact with the ground surface like the radar is in this case. Uh, um, but the radar gives us uh, really three dimensions. We're able to see the depth uh, or variability at various depths within the site. So it's, uh, if it's possible, uh, radar is, is, is generally more informative. In certain types of sites, though, the magnetometer is going to work much better. And in this case, the radar shows a lot more detail to see. Uh, this is what, what the, uh, the radar grid looks like, though. Uh, you can see that the, uh, some of the smaller pebbles and, in some cases, lithics, uh, lithic artifacts from the uh, desert pavement get sort of pushed into the, the dust beneath the surface. Now, over time, those are likely going to emerge again, but it may be 10 years, if we don't really know, so that's a, a potential impact that we were concerned about. So we didn't cover as much area with the, the radar grids. We tended to focus on previously surface-collected areas and uh, uh, truck track and, and uh, foot traffic areas as well. But that turned out to be uh, well enough of a sample for us to uh, to identify several features, um, and then I'll, I'll go through that process of how we identified those and uh, discern uh, which were likely geomorphic and which ones are potentially cultural features. Uh, but let me give you a quick rundown on how GPR works. Here's Professor Sinceri and myself doing GPR with two different uh, instruments. This is a 900 megahertz antenna with a tow handle. This is the CPU, the actual G, uh, GPR unit. SIR 3000 and the same unit over here with the 400 megahertz antenna on a cart. And both these antennas were employed at the Atacama project. Um, you'll see throughout the rest of the presentation these uh, transect profiles in grayscale, which are, are basically like the, the wall of an excavation unit in, in concept. It's basically the uh, a single GPR transect and the radar data in terms of information of uh, radar energy uh, bounced back to the receiving antenna, and so in this case, there's a horizon at this uh, maybe 40 centimeter depth out here at the faculty club, um, and we think it's concrete foundations from cottages that were there before the faculty club was built. Uh, this is the transect profile crossing a slice map. So this is an amplitude slice map of that particular depth where those features are located. So we'll look at slice maps in color at various depths, and then uh, the, the transit profiles, which are generated as the instrument moves across the ground surface and the buried object often shows as a hyperbola a single object, because the radar first picks it up when it's farther away, and then it's closer, and then it's farther away again as it moves across the object. Planar surfaces look a lot like planar surfaces in a regular um, geomorphic profile. Um, not to get into all the details of the, the technique, but one thing I do want to emphasize is that we're often limited by salt in soils. So uh, beaches are fine in the upper portion that's rinsed by fresh water, but when you get down towards the saltwater intrusion, you don't really get data. Because the salt crystals attenuate the radar signal, the energy doesn't come back to the antenna. Um, so that's been a limitation for previous GPR projects in the Atacama Desert, uh, based on not, not ones that I've done, but based on my communication with Larry Conyers and uh, uh, Peter Leach and others who've done uh, GPR projects down there. We were really fortunate, though, at QM35. We got great results, and I think and actually the other sites that we visited as well. So I think there's a lot of potential, um, at least for sites that are above the alkali uh, dehydration zone. Uh, another way of conceptualizing the slice maps coming from an individual profile. Okay, so back to the grids here. I'll just go through the process of uh, I number of grids sequentially um, and <clears throat> talk about how we, we uh, started doing uh, grids and individual transects and, and started to make sense of our findings. Um, this grid one was located up on that, that ridge, kind of at the northern edge of it, where it went along what we thought was the Paleo Channel below to the north. And uh, the slice maps at different depths showing this 20 meter long grid, 20 by 6 meters, up to 7 meters, um, show some real interesting patterns here, um, which we interpreted as potentially the bank of the channel that was incised. You know, I could think of megafauna game trails or other types of erosion that might uh, 
uh, have caused this sort of uh, pattern here, this arc shape to the, uh, to the edge of this buried surface of some kind. Um, and the profiles weren't, uh, they showed multiple strata, but they were, these profiles were going parallel to the ridge, so they didn't show um, any, any other real details. There were some interesting uh, disruptions to the, to the planar phenomena over here in the uh, east. Um, the second grid we did, just not too many meters, uh, to maybe 100 meters or 80 meters to the uh, south, uh, showed a really distinct feature in an otherwise, again, you know, a, a ridge parallel uh, stacked straight up beneath the, uh, the lus or dust that uh, forms the basis of the desert pavement. This is where most of the artifacts are. Um, but we wanted to understand this, this feature here that's zoomed in on this profile. Uh, it's more of a pit, it appears to be a pit feature. And so that one's actually undergoing excavation. It's the first one to be excavated. Um, so far, we don't have results, and it's, it's the heat of summer right now, so they're going to resume excavations here when it cools down in spring or in, in, uh, in May. Um, another grid we placed on this uh, area where two trucks were, where, where multiple vehicles had driven through, uh, just because it was an area we weren't concerned about uh, artifact integrity on the surface. Um, so this one's grid three. And this also revealed a potentially significant feature out here. Um, this grid's longer and also a narrow one. Um, you can see in the, in the multiple slice maps from the feature, that, uh, I mean, from the, for this grid, at different depths, uh, this is the feature's pretty distinct here in the top three, and then it disappears. So it's, it's got, you know, it's got vertical integrity as well as its, uh, its perimeter being in that shape. Uh, potentially one of those megatherium uh, features, it could be represented here. It could be uh, an area of, of uh, a large hearth. Um, I think though that because it's off the ridge, um, there's a chance that it predates the cultural occupation, but I do think it's an area that they'll be doing some excavation. Um, we also worked in a previously surface collected area here, I think uh, four by four meters, or five by five. Um, and in the center of that, there appears to be a high amplitude reflection here. I don't show the color scale in this case, but the red is high amplitude, yellow also high, green is in the middle, and blue and black are the low amplitude reflections. So high energy, potentially a heated uh, heart area here, or, or pit. Field that differs from the surrounding sediments. Um, and then grid five, I don't have a picture of on the surface, but um, really interesting patterns in this. If I'd been looking at a formative period site, uh, I'd be looking at this as a potential house pit, for example. This is these these grids are this is seven by five meters, I believe. Um, and so there's a really interesting arc-shaped feature here. By the time we got to grid five, we knew something was going on here. We don't think that there are house pits. Although there's always a possibility that there's some sort of a structure there. Um, so I started to uh, look into the literature on this, and um, one of the features we thought this might match up with is a yard end. It's these erosional features that are really deflationary. Um, so we thought potentially we have these in bush yard ends can occur where the tree trunks are located. Um, and this could be the, the trunk here, and this is an area that was held together by by uh, the, the roots of the, of the tree during some sort of erosion, like megaphonic trampoline or uh, fluvial erosion. Um, but that was just a hypothesis that we held for a while, and as, as Nico mentioned, we're, we're thinking more in terms of the inverted channel idea. Here's what appears to be a small channel. This is also off the ridge, but it could have been um, the base of a, of a deeper incision that uh, was contemporaneous with the, the channel that formed the ridge. And it runs across here. Again, it's maybe four by seven meters in the grid area, I think. And there's a, per, there's a, a, a traced uh, profile of a crossing, one of the transects crossing this, this channel feature. Uh, and that's located out here, that grid. And the long feature, with the, uh, the long grid for the feature in it is over here. But here we have these uh, distinctive features showing up in this, this ridge system. 
or what we're calling the ridge system, which actually isn't a true ridge. Um, after we met with, with Bill Dietrich and Ron Hansen, we basically went back to the drawing board on, on, on our interpretations of what these features might be, these geomorphic features. And you can think we, one of the things we did was to look at some of our profiles that cross <coughs> the ridge, which again is not a very distinctive ridge when you're standing on it, you can't really see it very clearly, but it's definitely higher than the area to the north of the deflation plane here and a, an area to the south with a little bit more abrupt slope on the north. But here we have, and I've traced them in red, multiple channel cuts that run the length of the ridge. So these are cross sections of this channel. So basically we do have a paleo channel that formed this ridge. It seems to, the, the radar data seems to support that. With occasional small channels off to the side, braided channels that would have meandered around. Um, in some cases, we do find, as, as, as that grid 61 example is showed, um, uh, lithics associated with these, these smaller channels off to the side. Um, but now it's a matter of understanding the landscape that people were living in at the time. Were they actually uh, living here while it was a stream flowing through, or did they somehow, did they come back to this area because it's higher ground subsequent to that? And my guess is, given that these channels don't represent the entire width, that this is probably the alluvial corridor that was vegetated that people lived in, and that the, uh, the channel at any one time would have meandered through, but not taken up the entire ridge top, so that the cultural material that's on the surface of the ridge from 12,000 years ago likely uh, represents use of this small river valley um, as it flowed through from the Andes towards the uh, the playa, the uh, evaporative playas to the, to the west. And then many of the features that we're looking at here then are likely to be more features related to the channel itself, um, rather than cultural features. So we don't have to explain this, this massive uh, arc shaped uh, feature as a cultural structure. But some of the features that are uh, present some of the smaller pit features and some of the smaller circular features that we've identified are still worthy of excavation as potential cultural features, but they may or may not be, given that there are so many other phenomena uh, determining uh, what's on the landscape here. Uh, so cultural features are, uh, are not yet confirmed in any of the GPR findings or the magnetometry findings, but they are, there is still some potential for that. So if you get back to, uh, so this is the ridge area again. The, the wetland down here was another place that we were able to use radar effectively. And uh, one of the ways we did it was to identify exposure to the black mat on the surface, which you can see where these arrows are pointing. There's no scale here, but uh, maybe it's uh, 80 meters across right there. Um, and this is one of the GPR timestamps transects that we took. Uh, but basically, tracing out the, uh, the, the black map from where it was identified in an outcrop and then following it below the surface shows up very distinctively this organic horizon. And in some cases, it's actually broken, which is kind of interesting. I wonder, I, you know, I don't really know if these are stumps or, or places where megafauna would have uh, traveled through the wetland. Um, but it's, it's definitely a phenomenon that we can trace out with the radar in different directions. So uh, we did some of that preliminarily, but we didn't do that systematically, so we don't know the full extent of it. Um, but I was able to, to trace, for example, uh, black mount in this direction, and then it disappeared before I got to the megatherium. And there's really no, in the vicinity of the megatherium fossil that was near the black mount, there's no organic paleo wetland underneath the megatherium. So we can, we can basically, in terms of time markers, the megatherium most likely predates the, the black man. Um, also, interestingly, we were able to find it, uh, I was tracing the horizon coming back from the, the west and following it to where it actually outcropped. And where I saw the black man outcrop in this looser sand, you can actually see a dark stain to the sand here that wasn't identified as, as that paleo wetland, but because we're able to trace it from a known exposure continuously and see it outcropped here, we're able to confirm that this is actually the perimeter of it. And there are lithics in the sediments 
on the surface here, so we can actually use the, the dated uh, paleo wetland plot uh, to bracket the chronology of the lithics that are on the surface. Okay, um, let's see, this is the general area of the black map. This is the, the inverted channel ridge system that was the alluvial corridor that has stumps in it. Um, and potentially cultural features and, and abundant uh, lithic materials. Um, and then the, the megafauna are outside, and, and there are stumps also that are outside. Some of those may uh, be considerably older than the cultural um, occupation. But basically we've been able to use radar and magnetometry to some degree, as well as this excellent drone uh, data to uh, along with the, the lithics and the, the sur surface sampling of botanical remains and radiocarbon dating, to begin to reconstruct the, the landscape at the time that the site was occupied. Kiln 35 is uh, approximately 12,000 years old, and uh, even though walking across the landscape it looks like a fairly simple scenario with lithics deflated apparently onto the surface, um, in reality, there's a lot of complexity to this landscape, and the reconstruction is really just getting started. But I do feel that uh, GPR, and potentially magnetometry, have a lot to offer at this site, and we've also seen at several other sites in uh, in the Atacama Desert um, there, that there's a lot of potential for using this type of remote sensing uh, to to research stratigraphy and features and cultural deposits in the Atacama. Sorry, yeah. So I was just going to conclude by saying that these are, so going back to our original uh, introduction, that these are important sites for understanding how people first came to live in the highlands as well as the coast, and, and Quebrada Bani represents one of these links to, to the highlands, and which is where we see a lot of the um, fluorescence in, in the Indian in, in the past. So, Thank you. So cool. Um, I'm a little bit impressed with that black man, chasing that black man out. But I just have a point of clarification and then a question about the interpretation. So the, when you're looking at the not full negative, or full negative panel that you guys are tracking, what was the relationship, I kind of missed it, the relationship that you think between the black man and the ridge? We're still a little uncertain. We have been able to trace the black map under some ridges that don't seem to have the channel deposits in them. So there are some, some sand dunes on the periphery of it. And, and that uh, Megatherium is higher than the black map, so it seems to have been a basin with the, with, with the perimeter to hold it in place. But uh, whether the channel spilled into it or... Um, yeah, we're not, we're not really certain at this point. There's not good radiocarbon on the, uh, the inverted channel deposits yet. So it's not contiguous all the way into your ridge? Yeah, we haven't. Well, the, there was that date on the black map that came back a thousand years younger, right? Than, than the 12,000 year old site. It was like yeah. 10, 5, or 11, yeah. which is interesting. So, so it looks like that was a lower area. Mm -hmm. We were wondering, was, what, was this what's now a ridge where all, in most of the archaeological material is? Was it a ridge and people lived there, or was it a channel that they were just off of the main channel? Nice getting stuff dumped into it. Yeah. That's freaking me out. Or a seasonal channel. A seasonal channel. There you go. But, but the fact that the black man is, is dated and lower suggests that uh, it, it was maybe a ridge because, I mean, it's only. It's Unless the map came down, then you got the alluvium, and then you got the channelization, the deflation, right? With the maps younger than human. The first. You're saying it's the first thing. Well, you're, 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 you're yeah, but you're just. Yeah, probably. The more challenges from the map are from what? Like 10,000 yeah, years ago. No, but it's the sample material. Oh, it's, it's vegetation. Mm -hmm. Is it just a bulk sample of the map? Uh, uh, they've they got twigs and leaves and things. And, and so, what's your video for the examples from the site? Those are from the. There's the an ass on that. So that, I mean, a thousand years difference isn't very much when you consider that the trees could have been around and used. Yeah. 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 yeah, this is amazing work, by the way. Yeah. This is really, really fascinating. And I just kept thinking about the 
comparisons between what we're trying to deal with the paleo wetlands and what are now desert environments in, in Eastern Jordan with my site. Mm -hmm. And you know, we have the same problems that you guys have in terms of, you know, by the end of the season, after we've trampled around the perimeters of the site and driven a four-wheel car truck in and out every day, you, there are some areas where we just can't drive. We have to change our path constantly mm -hmm. because the, the silt that gets blown up, even with a very with a small amount of wind, makes it challenging to work, even within a short time period. Mm -hmm. And so it always makes me think, and you know, our big challenge is trying to date the wetland deposits, the occupation of the site, and the surrounding terraces, and link those all together in meaningful ways, where we have such a dynamic shift between wetlands, permanent wetlands, seasonal wetlands, dry, arid periods mm -hmm. that are fluctuating. And so I wanted to ask, actually, what, if you have any dates on some of those off-site like OSL dates or anything like that, I don't know. Do you guys have anything to add in how they relate to it? What do you mean by off-site, I guess? So we have the ridge where you found most of the lithic material in this black mat. So in the surrounding areas, the terraces that are now these kind of the bones that we deposit. Well, see. They're connect, these channels are connected to uh, dry lake beds that are 15 to 10,000 years, or lakes 10 or 15,000 years ago. And uh, so um, there's a lot of deflation there, but also there's, pure, there's small places of uh, less accumulation, and the less started to accumulate around 20,000 years ago, and, and uh, the rates of uh, less accumulation um, dropped quite rapidly during the Holocene, but they're still accumulating. So there's lots of deflation going on, but local pockets of dust accumulation. So it's all sort of a uh, post uh, LGM um, sort of phenomenon that's going on there. Um, but basically, there's a. This is just part of a big regional picture of the whole Atacama Desert was rejuvenated uh, fluvially during the late Pleistocene, and lots of dry lake beds all over the desert were uh, lakes and marshes and everything. The concept, even 15 years ago, that the Atacama Desert was a archaeological uh, desert, or there was nothing there, is uh, really. I think um, completely being overturned right now. One thing I didn't mention is that this is one area where these rivers are not going to be the coast. So in terms of down cutting, you know, these are kind of flattening out into these lakes that we mentioned right here. Whereas here, this is continuing to down cut, and that's maybe why we're getting all this rain and evaporating salt pans here. So it's a really unusual spot compared to each other. <coughs> There's lots of uh, archaeology that's not even sh that these guys don't even have there. I mean, you can walk around all these uh, dry lake beds and find maybe oodles and oodles of stuff. Uh, Bill and I have been out there, and it's just <laughs> we have contests to see who can get out of the car and find archaeology first. Uh, it's really fun. <laughs> There's no shortage of, of uh, material out there. It's amazing you find these big cores right on the surface that would have been reused by later people in almost any other place, but not here because it got drier and wasn't a nice place to be. Do you have any sense of the, these solares that you have in one, two, three on this map? When they went from being a lake to a solar, I mean, when did they finally, when did the water finally evaporate away? I mean, they should have been there when you're a folk who are living there. Yeah, we've got, there, yeah, there, we've got right? a paper on that. There, uh, we have dates on all of those. Uh, there's, there's so they this, would have... This, that paper, right? Would it be... Uh, would it be then, like around 10,000 years ago? Yeah, 15 to 10. Mm -hmm. Well, that's key, whether it's 15 or 10. Well, it, there's a... It spanned most of that time. So they were drying, drying, drying. Well, no, drawing and then wetting and then drawing. Well, we don't have that complete of a record, but we have uh, episodes of shells and salt, uh, carbonate and 
plants and all sorts of things that you know, get a range of, of periods when there was water there, or certain points in time when there was water. <coughs> Oh, I have one more. Did, you, did the drum work find any um, um, geoglyphs? Is there uh, people were here? Here, would they make any geoglyphs? There's beautiful geoglyphs. They're very close to here, but they're all formative. It's all believable. <laughs> 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 right here. But there, there's actually farming, and as we were talking about earlier, I came out of my knee and it's peanut candy. And, uh, there's farming in this area that probably dates to perhaps if they would have peanuts in the food. <laughs> we, we talked with Closure about possibly using GPR to map some of the geoglyphs that are partially buried by dunes. <laughs> 